The Fed hasn't won the inflation battle. It's not even close to winning that battle. But what guys like Jeremy Siegel and other people are doing, they're pointing to home prices and they're saying, look, real estate prices are falling. That's a sign that inflation is over. And he points to the fact that a couple of years ago, when real estate prices were rising, the Fed was ignoring that and they were just focusing on the shelter component of the CPI, which was dominated by owner's equivalent rent and that owner's equivalent rent was barely rising. And so he said, hey, the Fed should ignore owner's equivalent rent and look at home prices. Well, now he's saying the same thing. He's saying the Fed needs to ignore owner's equivalent rent that is rising and instead focus on home prices that are falling. So at least he's consistent in that respect. But the reason I think he's wrong about just looking at home prices is because home prices are not the real determinant of the cost of shelter. What you pay to buy a home is like the admission ticket to home ownership. But what's important is not what it costs you to get into your house, but how much it costs you to stay in your house. The cost of home ownership continues to go up at an accelerating rate. And that is going to factor into owner's equivalent rent. And in fact, for a long time, I was talking about the lag between owner's equivalent rent and home prices and actual costs related to owning a home because a lot of those costs get factored in to what rent would be, but not just rent, but what you pay to own a home. And the costs that I am referring to are number one, the mortgage. So even if the price of the house that you're buying comes down. If the interest rate on the money you have to borrow to buy that house goes way up, it could still cost you more. Monthly payments on a $400,000 mortgage could be bigger than monthly payments on a $450,000 mortgage. It all depends on how much higher the interest rate is. And what Americans are really buying when they buy a home is the monthly payment. The actual price they pay for the home is irrelevant because most people are never going to pay off their mortgage. All they care about is, can I swing the monthly payment? So that's what they look at. They say, how much will the monthly payments be if I buy this house? So the actual price is kind of irrelevant. It's the mortgage payments. And what's happening now is as prices are dropping, mortgage payments are rising. And in fact, it's rising interest rates that are suppressing home prices because that's the only way somebody can afford to buy when the interest rates are higher is if the purchase price is lower. But then you've got to go beyond the mortgage and look at the other costs like insurance. Insurance rates are skyrocketing. I went over that. My own insurance rate went up by 40%. What is driving insurance rates up? It's the cost to repair a home if something goes wrong. The material costs the labor costs, everything costs a lot more money. And so it costs the insurance companies more money to pay claims. Plus the insurance companies are taking hits to their investment portfolios, to their bond portfolios. They've got claims coming in from hurricanes. So they have got to recover those costs. They've got to get it from their policyholders. So insurance rates are going up. Property taxes, governments are in trouble. They need more money. Their tax revenues are down. Their interest costs are up. What are they doing? They raise taxes. Plus, when property prices go up in many states, your property tax automatically goes up because it's tied to the appraised value of your home. So even if they don't raise your taxes, the fact that your house is going up in value automatically raises your taxes. So property tax are going up. Now your maintenance costs, well, they're obviously going up. Anything that goes wrong is gonna cost you a lot more money to fix it. And then you've got your utility bills. When you own a home, You got to heat it in the winter. You got to cool it in the summer. That costs a lot more money than it used to cost. And especially if someone is buying a home and they're coming from a smaller apartment, when you have more square footage to cool and heat, it ends up costing a lot more money. So if all these other costs are going up, then the only thing that can give is the price of the home. But to then conclude that because the price of a house is dropping, that the government has won the battle of inflation because shelter costs are going down, shelter costs are not going down. They're going up. 
It's just the asset price that's going down. Now, the same thing is going to happen with the stock market. When we start to see lower stock prices, we've already have seen lower stock prices. That doesn't mean there's less inflation. Yes, the air is coming out of the stock market bubble. The inflation is moving from asset prices to consumer prices. And the same thing is going to happen with real estate. Inflation is going to move out of real estate prices to other prices. But this is not a sign of relief. Also, you've got people like Jeremy Siegel pointing to the decline in commodity prices and saying, aha, this is a leading indicator. The Fed ignored rising commodity prices when it said inflation was transitory. But now that commodity prices are falling, the Fed is ignoring that and acting as if inflation is here to stay. So according to Jeremy Siegel, the Fed should take its cue from the weakness in the commodity market. And I think he is dead wrong there. I think what we see in commodity markets is a bear market sell-off correction in an otherwise bull market. And the reason that we got this correction in commodities was because of how aggressive the Fed was. All the rate hikes and quantitative tightening, all of that strength in the US dollar and that strong dollar weakened international economies, but also softened demand for commodities that are priced in dollars. And so the dollar strength led to that commodity weakness. But the minute the Fed caves, pivots, and acknowledges that it's not going to be as tight as the markets thought, now the dollar starts to fall and the commodities start to rise again. Think about that catch-22 for a minute. The only reason that we get relief in commodity prices is because of how aggressive the Fed is. Its aggressive stance causes a sharp rise in the dollar which reduces commodity prices. Now, with lower commodity prices, people say, oh, look, the inflation threat is over. Commodity prices are falling. We don't have to worry anymore. And now because commodity prices are falling, the Fed doesn't have to be as vigilant. It can say, hey, we've won the battle against inflation. We don't have to be as tough as we said. And now because the Fed has telegraphed that future rate hikes will be less aggressive, the market is selling off the dollar. And because the dollar is going down, that is taking the pressure off of commodity prices, allowing those prices to rise. So in other words, the minute the Fed claims victory on inflation because commodity prices have fallen, the dollar tanks and now commodity prices hit new highs. And so now whatever progress the Fed has made has been lost. So they're in a situation where they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't because if they ever indicate that they're winning the race against inflation because a strong dollar is reducing commodity prices, then the dollar falls, commodity prices hit new highs, and then inflation takes the lead and the Fed falls even further behind the curve. And I think what's going to happen before long is we're going to be hitting new highs in commodities as the dollar begins to sink and the recession gets worse. And again, as I've been saying, when we're in recession and we have inflation, both are there and the Fed has to choose because they can't fight them both because they require opposite policies according to the Keynesian playbook, which is the only one they've got. So if they have to make a choice, are we going to pursue policies to fight off this recession and rising unemployment or are we going to ignore the recession and rising unemployment and fight inflation? It's clear politically the choice they're going to make. In fact, that's the choice they made in the UK. And I think that we faced a UK moment in the bond market on Friday. That's why the Fed let out that trial balloon through the Wall Street Journal of slowing down the pace of rate hikes. And so far, so good when it comes to the trial balloon because we did get a floor, at least temporarily, in the bond market. And that took the pressure off of the stock market and allowed that relief rally that been going on since Friday. But I think most significantly was the action in the foreign exchange markets, the big sell-off that we had in the dollar. In fact, last week was another outside reversal week for the dollar. This is the second time We've seen this in the US dollar where the dollar index took out the high from the previous week and then closed the week below the low from the previous week. So I think the US dollar index has really carved out a pretty big top just under 115. As I'm recording this podcast now, Tuesday evening, the dollar index is trading just at 111. In fact, we were below 111 during the day. 
but we're well off the highs. And I think that we've topped out. I've been talking about this potential top, and I thought it was interesting the last time I did my podcast when we had a big sell-off in the bond market that hurt the stock market. The dollar did not make a new high. Gold did not make a new low. And I looked at that as a significant divergence, not only because I thought it indicated that we had already seen the highs in the dollar and the lows in gold, but because I believe it meant the markets were now starting to price in the pivot. And now that we may have had the pivot, well, they're going to price it in even more aggressively. And one of the places that you're going to see it first is in the U.S. dollar. Now, still, I would like to see the dollar index below 105, which is still six handles beneath where we are now before I can say 100 percent that the dollar has seen its highs, but I'm getting more and more convinced that that's what's happened. 